G'day guys, this is Tia and welcome back to the channel. This is the first episode of my new Fallout 76 build videos, and I couldn't be more excited to bring you guys this series. We are starting off with my unarmed slash melee build, Freya, the Queen Killer. If you want to skip ahead at all, then all of the timestamps will be on screen right now, so you can navigate to the parts of the video that you want to see. Also, the Nooks and Dragons build link will be in the description and pinned comment so you can easily follow along. Now this build is the ultimate melee slash unarmed build, and if you've never played as a melee character before, then now is the perfect time for you to try it out. Because with the special build loadouts machine system, you can easily make this one of your builds to swap in and out whenever you like. And if you'd like to check out some of my other builds after watching this video, then be sure to check out my playlist. Anyway guys, let's get into it. I've taken the liberty of ranking all of my new builds with a 5 star rating system based on the build's survivability, damage output, stealth ability, mobbing and bossing ability, gear requirements, and its effectiveness in solo and team play. So that you can see early on whether or not this is something that may interest you. Because the purpose of this build is to make the most effective and brutally damaging unarmed build possible. And for that we need to min-max towards being bloodied and towards having the most amount of strength and melee damage output as humanly possible. This build has 50 strength at base value and can go as high as 70 strength if you include buffs. And if you didn't know, each point of strength adds plus 5% melee damage and plus 10% unarmed damage. So this is really, really effective. Also, this build has the ability to tank large amounts of damage and play a backup role as a hard-hitting tank as well as a stealth DPS. I'm really, really proud of this build, and if you've seen my original build video on this character, I think you'll love the improvements I've made. So enough with the intro, let's jump straight into the actual build itself. So let's start off with the special stats. As you can see, we will be taking the following stats for our build. 15 Strength, 1 Perception, 7 Endurance, 4 Charisma, 3 Intelligence, 15 Agility, and 11 Luck. That will be our base special stats to start off with. So if you're following along, this is what you'll need your special stats to be. And then we will add on the special legendary attribute perks. For this build in particular, I have chosen max rank of legendary strength, which will increase our strength by 5 points. I have purely taken this for the slight damage boost it yields to the melee and unarmed build, and I will not be making use of its ability to allow us to use any extra regular perk cards because once I finished the build, I found nothing else in the regular perk card deck that would benefit the build. At least nothing that would benefit it more than 5 extra points of strength. So I decided to look at it this way. The legendary strength perk card simply is a 25% melee damage boost and a 50% unarmed damage boost. Now, you could go against the grain here and pick another legendary attribute perk to get some regular perks if you wish to. But like I said, once you see the build in its finished state, hopefully you'll see there isn't much else that's worth picking. Legendary Strength will bring our base strength so far up to 20, and then, just to show you where we will be sitting at with some boosts, once we are low health and everything is finished and finalised, this is what our special stats will be looking like once unyielding armour and the perks and everything is taken into account. When the build is done, you will have 50 Strength, 18 Perception, 11 Endurance, 19 Charisma, 14 Intelligence, 26 Agility, and 26 Luck. So yeah, once everything is said and done, our special stats are looking pretty damn good. And now we make our way to the meat of the video, the perks. This is what makes the build so powerful. Perks are the most important part of any build, and if you're into min-maxing like I am, you'll be pleased to see that not a single perk point is wasted. I've been playing this character since beta for over two years now, and at this point I think that I'm safe to say that I've perfected the unarmed melee build. Like I said at the start, our goal here is to primarily deal as much damage as humanly possible, and we need every ounce of damage we can get since melee was so heavily nerfed recently. In addition to dealing maximum damage, we want to ensure that we have good survivability and ways to tank damage, as well as sustain health regeneration before dying, since obviously we are playing a very high risk, high reward build here. We need to get up close and personal to deal the damage, and then we need to ensure that we do not die. And obviously being at low health, that just amplifies the high risk, high reward factor tenfold. Honestly, I think this build is one of the most fun ways to play the game. Alright, and here we are guys, this is the regular perk card deck for the ultimate 
melee slash unarmed build, the Queen Killer. If you'd like to skip ahead because I'm just going to list off every single perk, then feel free to do so. If you'd also like to just maybe take a screenshot for later reference, if you want to take a look at it later on in your own time, feel free to do that right now. There's your opportunity to take a screenshot. But anyways, let's get straight into it. So first off, we have Barbarian. We're going to be taking this to slightly increase our damage resistance and make us a bit more tanky. So at max rank it's going to give us 80 damage resistance points because obviously we have more than enough strength to qualify for that max rank of it. The next up we've got Iron Fist. Obviously I'm going to be using this if I'm using unarmed weapons. If you want to use one handed or two handed weapons then I'll have a variation for that shown in just a moment. But this is going to make our unarmed punching attacks do 20% more damage. So things like Deathclaw Gauntlets, Power Fists, stuff like that. More damage, we love that here. We're all about damage here on this channel. Anyways. Moving on, we've got Blocker. With this perk, you're going to take 45% less damage from your opponent's melee attacks. Now, this perk is absolutely supremely important for melee builds, because obviously you're going to be attacking everyone with your melee attacks, then you're going to be in range of the enemy's melee attacks as well. And some of the enemy's melee attacks in this game really fucking hurt. <laughs> they do a lot of damage. But if you have this perk on, then it feels like they are hitting you with balloon animals. It takes away a lot of the sting for the enemy attacks. Next up we have Incisor. At max rank this will grant all of our melee and unarmed weapons 75% armor penetration. Now this is the biggest buff we can give to our melee and unarmored weapons. Cutting through that much of a target's damage resistance and energy resistance is huge. 75% is no joke and this perk is definitely worth picking up for your melee build. Next up we've got Martial Artist. This will make our melee weapons weigh 60% less which is nice, that allows us to carry a lot more in our inventory. But the main bit of this perk is allowing us to swing 30% faster. Now this is freaking huge. This increases our DPS potential by 30%. And obviously if you pair it with a faster swing speed legendary effect weapon, which is 40%, obviously these two stack together, then your DPS increase is huge. But anyways, moving on to Perception, we have rank 1 of Glow Sight. Now obviously Perception is a dump stat for this build, there's nothing in here that actually benefits the melee build or playstyle, there's nothing we want in here, and we are forced to have at least one point in Perception, so I decided to get that with rank 1 of Glow Sight. So this allows us to deal 20% more damage to glowing enemies, it's nice, it's a nice boost, as glowing enemies are typically a little bit tougher, so this equalizes that out a little bit, makes us do slightly more damage to them. Then next up we've got Endurance. So right here we have max rank of Ghoulish. Now Ghoulish is a supremely, supremely underrated perk card. This perk card is so useful in so many situations. I've done a whole video on this covering how this heals you and how it works. It's amazing, you really need to pick it up. And it's especially useful on melee builds because most enemies in the wasteland deal radiation damage with their melee attacks, which obviously is going to affect us when they hit us. But with this perk, all of their irradiation melee attacks doesn't actually hurt us. Instead, it heals us, which is fucking huge. This is just like a free health regeneration if you think about it. Especially at the Queen fight, where the Queen has that aura cloak of radiation around her. This will just basically be healing us over time and make us very hard to kill. Then next up we have Fireproof. At max rank, this makes us take 45% less damage from explosions and flame attacks. Very useful. In my opinion, I think that this perk card should be on every single build, no matter what you're doing, it's very important. But for this one in particular, it's very useful against Scorch Beasts, because if you didn't know, their Sonic Breath attacks do count as explosions, so this helps negate that and makes it feel like it is doing nothing against you. Moving on, we have Radical. Now this perk synergizes very, very well with this build, because obviously we're going to be at low health, we're going to have radiation covering most of our health, so this synergizes greatly with this, especially since we are melee. Because when we have our radiation covered, this perk will give us plus 5 to strength, which basically increases our carry weight along with our melee and unarmed damage. It increases our melee damage by 25% and our unarmed damage by 50%, so definitely worth getting for only one point. Then into Charisma, we have Stranger Numbers. Now this just increases our mutations by 25% if you are on a team and if those teammates are mutated also, which should be happening. I don't know many people that run without mutations because they're so useful. But yeah, this basically just makes our mutations 25% stronger, so we'll be dealing even more damage with our adrenal reaction, our talons, our twisted muscles, and stuff like that. It's very worth it for only one point, so I recommend picking it up. Then to fill up charisma, we have max rank of tenderizer. Now this perk is amazing. 
This perk makes your target receive 10% more multiplicative damage for 10 seconds after you attack. So basically every hit after your second hit on an enemy will be dealing a lot more damage because it is multiplicative. That means the 10% goes a lot further than if it was additive. Definitely worth it. It helps us deal a lot more damage, which is the point of this build. Moving on to intelligence, we have max rank of Nerd Rage. Now this perk is important. It is so important for a bloody build. I don't know any bloody builds out there that don't run Nerd Rage because it's just so damn useful. It synergizes so well with the build and the playstyle. So what it does is while you're below 20% health, you gain 40 damage resistance, makes us a little bit more tanky. You also gain 20% extra damage. So obviously more damage onto an already damage dealing build. Can't pass that up. And then on top of that, it makes your AP regenerate 15% faster, which is huge. We're going to be using AP a lot in this build because we're going to be using hack and slash. So that means we're going to be using VATS. We're going to be sprinting towards targets to close the gap so that we can actually fight them and punch them. So yeah, we're definitely going to need some high AP regen. Speaking of high AP regen, we move on to agility. So we've got this maxed out, obviously. We've got 15 points in agility. This allows us to take max rank of action girl slash boy, depending on your character's gender. This makes our AP regenerate 45% faster. Obviously, that's going to be huge for our hack and slash perk. We're going to be using vats a lot. We're going to be sprinting a lot to close the gap between ourselves and the enemies. So that's definitely going to help a lot. Next up, we've got evasive. This basically just adds up 45 points of damage resistance and energy resistance to a character. Makes us a little bit more tanky and we obviously qualify for that maxed out part. We can get the full 45 because we have so much agility. Then moving on, we have moving target, another perk to make us slightly more tanky. We gain 45 damage and energy resistance while sprinting. Very useful if you're going to be using a melee build, which we obviously are because we're going to be closing the gap. Like I keep saying, we're going to be sprinting a lot from point A to point B. We're going to be sprinting absolutely everywhere to try and attack our enemies and hit them with our melee weapons. So having more damage resistance while we are sprinting is definitely useful. And this will synergize with some stuff later on in the video. Then we have Adrenaline. Now this perk is just huge for damage. You gain more damage output the more enemies you kill. Maxing out at 60%. Lasts for 30 seconds and it refreshes with every kill you get. So basically, if you're in a huge group of enemies or you've got a bunch of enemies in front of you, you're going to be killing all of them. You're going to be dealing progressively more and more damage as you go. Definitely useful for this build and I highly recommend chucking it on. Then finally for agility, we have rank 1 of Gun Fu. Now you might be asking, Tia, why the fuck do you have rank 1 of Gun Fu on a melee build? And my answer to that is, because it's amazing. <laughs> no, seriously, if you have never used Gun Fu on a melee build, then you're missing out. The VAT swap ability on melee in particular is especially potent and so useful for dealing with crowd control situations. Now this paired with Hack and Slash and Exploding Palm, which I'll get to later on, makes our crowd control, our mobbing ability, so potent. We can take out large groups of enemies very, very easily, and plus having that 10% extra damage on our next VATS target is very useful. Can't pass that up. The reason I haven't maxed this out is because with all of these things in here, we only had one spot left, one point left that was unfilled, and I decided that we only needed it at rank 1 just to get the VAT swap ability. Improving this to the second rank or third rank for the extra damage is not very practical since we never really target more than two enemies with VATs as the whole group tends to die out very quickly due to Exploding Palm and Hack and Slash. Now moving on to luck, we have max rank of Bloody Mess. Now this is just a straight up damage boost for 15%. At the moment it is additive so it doesn't yield quite as much damage as you'd expect. Now I do think that they will rectify this and make it multiplicative in the future so I'm holding out hope for that. If you don't want to pop in Bloody Mess because you think the damage that it gives is so negligible, I highly recommend chucking in Grim Reaper's Sprint because Grim Reaper's Sprint will give you the chance to fully regenerate your AP every time you kill an enemy. Like I said we're going to be using Vats a lot so that will be very useful. Anyways, we've got max rank of Serendipity, now this is the crutch to every low health bloody build. If you don't have this and you're a low health bloody build, you're definitely doing it wrong. You can't have a bloody build without serendipity, it's just so useful. What it does is while you're below 30% health, you gain a 45% chance to avoid all incoming damage. Now this thing does proc very often, it's almost a half 50% chance to happen and it just is so powerful. I mean, a chance to avoid all incoming damage. That means that you could avoid entirely a shot that would have killed you. So yeah, it's definitely worth chucking on. It improves our sustainability, our survivability, just our health, our tankiness, all of that sort of stuff. It makes it so much harder to put us down. 
Then in a very similar fashion we have Ricochet. This perk is very useful, it synergizes with a lot of other perks and if you want to know more about that I have done a video covering that extensively which I will link right now. But basically you gain an 18% chance to take no damage whatsoever from ranged attacks. It's basically like Serendipity except it exclusively works on ranged attacks. And like I said it does synergize with a lot of other things so this means when you do ricochet bullets back it will activate things like tenderizer and it will heal you if you are holding a vampire's weapon so yeah it's very useful. Then finally we have starch jeans. Now this is just needed for every build you sadly do need to waste two points to keep your chosen mutations which I think is kind of annoying but anyways with this perk on we will be able to keep on our chosen mutations the ones we actually want and it will stop us from getting other mutations that might negatively affect our build. So yes, that is the build in its constant and finished form, but let's take a closer look so that I can show you that there can be variation and opportunity for you to switch in certain perks under certain conditions. For example, when you are alone and not on a team, I recommend that you would switch out Strange in Numbers and Tenderizer for Lone Wanderer, and obviously vice versa. Then if you are in a sticky situation with a Scorch Beast and it just refuses to land, I highly recommend having the perk card Enforcer and a shotgun in your back pocket to substitute in as it's needed. With this you would obviously use Vats to cripple the wings and force it to land so that you may finish it off with your melee attacks. This is a very useful strategy for melee builds. Furthermore, when you are looking to take more of a stealthy approach instead of brute forcing your way through everything, I highly recommend that you switch out the perks Moving Target evasive and gunfu for the perks called sneak, ninja and escape artist and obviously vice versa if you'd like to switch back. This way you can effectively and efficiently play both a sneak melee build as well as a brute force tank melee build. And then finally if you wish to use one handed or two handed melee weapons instead of the more effective unarmed playstyle then you are more than welcome to substitute those perks in. Obviously you'll be dealing less damage and you'll be less tanky if you do decide to do this but nonetheless, it is an option. For this, I recommend taking out Barbarian, Blocker, Iron Fist, and putting in either all ranks of Slugger or Gladiator perk cards, depending on what weapon you are using. So yes, those are the regular perk cards. If you follow this to the letter and copy it card for card, I guarantee that you'll be doing brilliantly and will have just set yourself up for a tremendously efficient and adaptable melee build. But now it's time to show you the legendary perk cards. So here we are with the Queen Killers, legendary perk card list. Firstly, I have max rank of exploding palm. This gives me a 20% chance to trigger an explosion every time I punch an enemy with unarmed weapons or unarmed attacks. So basically, this explosion is guaranteed to deal roughly 150 damage. So basically, it's just a 20% chance to deal an extra 150 damage in a small area of effect location. So this means I could hurt a large amount of enemies if they're all clustered together with a single punch. It's very useful, it helps with crowd control, and it's just an extra bit of damage on an already powerful build. Now obviously this only works with unarmed, so if you don't use unarmed, if you use one-handed or two-handed weapons, you will have to substitute that in for collateral damage, which does work with all melee weapons instead of unarmed. Now this one works by killing enemies, so this one's a little bit less effective. With this one you have a 20% chance to make an enemy explode when you kill them. So yeah, like I said, not as effective as the exploding palm perk. Anyways, next up we have max rank of hack and slash. This is the melee build's ultimate, ultimate legendary perk card. If you have a melee build and you're not rocking hack and slash, you are missing out. This perk card is so powerful and so useful. So basically at max rank, it's a 50% chance for your melee vats attack to do area damage. And what this hack and slash perk actually does is it takes the damage that your weapon is actually doing in the pip boy it takes that and distributes it into the area of effect attack so basically if you're doing 500 damage for example with your power fist and hack and slash procs then you'll be dealing that same 500 damage in a small area of effect aoe attack so you'll be dealing 500 damage to every single enemy around that aoe attack which is tremendously valuable it's basically just like a very useful melee cleave ability and this combined with exploding palm opens a lot of doors for crowd control and increasing your mobbing potential because obviously both of these perks deal AoE damage in their own specific way and both are very useful for that reason. Next up we have taking one for the team. I don't have this maxed out 
at the moment sadly, but if I did, it would be tremendously useful if I was on a team. Because we are melee, we are right in the enemy's faces, we're right in the line of fire, we're getting shot, we're getting hit, we're getting attacked, all the time. Okay, all the time. So when you are on a team and you're getting attacked, all of those enemies that just shot at you, that just punched you, that just attacked you, you will be dealing 40% more damage to those enemies. So it is very, very useful. Especially since we are a semi-tank build, we are able to sustain a lot of fire, we're able to take a lot of punishment. This means that we are in a unique position to take this damage and then redistribute a bit of our own back onto the enemy. Then next up, we have Legendary Strength. Now, as I said earlier on in the video, I've purely taken this for the damage boost. I'm not using it so that I can get more regular perk cards because I haven't found anything that improves the build more than what I'm already using. And since this gives us strength, it basically gives our build, our melee build, extra damage. So basically, I'm just looking at it like this. This perk right here gives us 25% extra melee damage and 50% extra unarmed damage. So that's the reason I've taken it. I think that it's far more useful than any other legendary perks for this build. And you are more than welcome to do your own research here if you weigh up the usefulness of this, if you just look at it as a damage boost. In comparison with other regular perk cards that you could be choosing, you'll find that this is better. So yeah, that's my reason for using this. It's just a damage boost in my eyes. If you don't want to use it for that reason, then you're more than welcome to try and find another use for a different legendary perk card. Then next up, we have Funky Duds. Now this is amazing for all bloody builds because with such low health, poison damage becomes quite a bit of a nuisance. But with this perk card, we resist almost all of that poison damage entirely so that it does basically nothing to us. We don't have to worry about My Alert Kings, My Alert Queens, Sting Wings, My Alert Hunters, things that would be giving us poison damage. So all of that DOT, damage over time damage that we were taking, can just fuck off because it doesn't affect us anymore. Next up, we have Retribution. Now, this perk card is kinda iffy. I can't think of anything better to use here. There's nothing else that really affects melee. I mean, there is Brawling Chemist, but that perk card is just dog shit. You're better off using regular chems instead of the chem that that thing gives you. But yeah, this legendary perk, I feel like it needs a buff because getting at max rank 4 HP and 4 AP when you block an enemy's attack is not a lot. So I feel like it needs more of an oomph, it needs more of a buff to really make it feel like it's worth it. But as it stands right now, I have tried to incorporate blocking more into my playstyle and my build. And it is a nice little boost. It is noticeable that you do regenerate your health and your AP. So if you do pick up this one, Try incorporating blocking into your playstyle, into your everyday movement, and you'll find some use out of it. So yes, those are our legendary perks and why I have decided to use them. Honestly, I wish that there were more creative and intuitive options here. More cards that actually benefited the melee playstyle would be great, but sadly, for right now, there are not. But, if new ones do ever get added in the future, I'll be sure to cover them for this build. Anyways, this brings us to the part of the build where I show you my mutations and why I have chosen them. As you may have noticed in the perks section of this video, we did not pick up Class Freak, because for all intensive purposes, it is useless. The negative effects for our chosen mutations do not need to be reduced because they do not affect us. The negatives for these mutations are insignificant and don't matter. Therefore, I cannot justify wasting 3 points on Class Freak. It's also worth noting that when we are on a team with strange numbers, all of the mutation positives will increase by 25%. Anyway, I'll just list and explain them one by one. Firstly, we have Adrenal Reaction. Obviously because this is a perfect synergy with our build, we are low health and low health equals more damage. So taking this mutation increases our damage by a further 50% when we are low health, as well as gives us a slightly faster health regeneration for when we do use healing items. The minus to health here is of no consequence and does not matter in the long run since we are so tanky already and are at such low health anyway. Next up is Marsupial. Now this is just the staple of the game at this point, everyone runs it on every build. It increases our jump height which has an untold amount of benefits as well as increasing our carry weight by 20, which is amazing and very useful. The negative being minus 4 to intelligence which doesn't matter to us since unyielding negates that effect anyway and we still end up with a lot of intelligence in the end. Then we have Speed Demon, another staple that most can't live without. It increases our movement speed and reload speed by 25%, and movement speed obviously being the main appealing use for this for the build, since we don't reload any weapons. Anyways, 
its negative doesn't even matter, because there are no consequences to being starving or thirsty anymore. Then next up we have Grounded. This is nothing but positives for us. We gain 100 energy resistance, and the negative of doing less damage with ranged energy weapons doesn't matter, since we don't use any ranged energy weapons. We're a bloody melee build. Anyways, next up is Talons. An obvious choice, it grants us a small bleed damage over time effect when we hit enemies with our unarmed weapons, plus it makes our unarmed attacks do 25% more damage. I definitely think this is worth the negative 4 to agility. Then for the same reasons we have Twisted Muscles. With this our melee, one-handed and two-handed attacks will do 25% more damage and have a chance to cripple enemy limbs. Very useful if that is your weapon of choice. Obviously the accuracy penalty to ranged weapons doesn't matter since we won't be using them in the first place. Then we have Carnival. If you're a melee build of any type, you should be running Carnival, as this is where the large majority of melee and unarmed damage buffs come from. There are a lot of meat based food items that grant bonuses to the melee playstyle, and with Carnival we can double those effects for even greater benefits. The negative here being you can't eat veggie or plant based foods, which is fine since there are no herbivore food buffs that grant bonuses to melee anyway. Then I also have Chameleon. Now, this one doesn't really matter, doesn't affect us in any which way because we're never going to be running around without any clothes on, without any armor on. But if for whatever reason you do decide to strip down naked, you'll be invisible and you'll have a little bit extra damage resistance when you stand still. So yeah, I guess why not? <laughs> then finally, we will be taking Unstable Isotope. This is a really fun mutation. Basically, when you are struck by a melee attacking enemy, you have a 10% chance to erupt into a small nuclear blast dealing roughly 100 damage to the enemy, and then it damages you for 8 damage and deals 80 to 120 radiation damage to yourself. But this is of no consequence since we have Ghoulish. Every time this mutation activates, we will actually heal ourselves more than we damage ourselves. So basically because of Ghoulish, this mutation is a randomly chanced healing ability that also damages enemies. It's definitely worth it in my opinion. So that's it for the mutations. Obviously remember to equip starch genes to keep these chosen mutations and not accidentally gain any new ones. Now let's move on to weapons. As you can see here, I have a plethora of melee weapons. I've named them all and while I do have a large collection, I only ever use a handful of them. The best weapon without a doubt for the unarmed build would be the Industrial Gauntlet. This yields the highest damage per hit in its unarmed class, and you can buy the plan from Samuel in Foundation. This is followed closely by the Power Fist and then the Deathclaw Gauntlet in terms of damage output. But then if we are talking about one-handed or two-handed weapons, you would want to be chasing weapons like the Super Sledge, Sheep Squatch Club and Staff, the War Glaive, or the Plasma Cutter. These are some of the most damaging melee and unarmed weapons in the game, but it doesn't stop right here. You've also got to ensure that they have the correct legendary effects on them to make them as powerful as they can be, and to synergize them with your build. And this is very simple for a bloody low health melee unarmed character. It basically boils down to one option. You must ensure for this build that your chosen weapon has the primary legendary effect of bloodied, which will increase your damage output in small increments that lower your health all the way up to 95% extra damage while you are below 5% health. Then for the tier 2 legendary modifier, we will want to aim for the 40% faster melee swing speed. This will drastically increase our DPS and ensure that we are always able to attack enemies as quickly as possible. Most of the time, even before the enemy can react. The other option here for the second star is that you go for 40% more pair attack damage. Now this is if you'd like to deal as much damage per swing as possible. Both are valid options, however I prefer the faster swing speed over the extra pair attack damage. Then finally for the tier 3 legendary modifier, the third star, we will want to aim for plus 1 to strength, just for that little bit of extra melee damage output, especially since the other options here aren't too great. So yeah, ideally no matter what your actual weapon is, you should try to aim for it to either be a bloodied swing speed plus one strength god roll weapon, or a bloodied pair attack plus one strength god roll weapon. And obviously, this video was made before tier 4 and 5 star legendary modifiers were made available to the public, so I'm not sure what effects will be released with that, but I will be covering that when they come out. 
Additionally, if you're comfortable with your build's damage output and you are alright with sacrificing some damage to become far tankier than normal, then I highly recommend that you use a Vampire's melee weapon as a backup weapon. I personally use a Vampire's swing speed plus one strength power fist and it treats me very well. I find myself to basically become unkillable when I am using this weapon, as the 2% health regeneration per hit with the faster swing speed effect, combined with the synergy with the ricochet perk card, allows for some very efficient health sustainability. Now this does bring us to what modifications you should put on your melee weapons. It's pretty simple really. All melee weapons follow a trend of having a small amount of decent modification options, and then they will have that one modification that is objectively better than the rest. Ideally, I would recommend that you take modifications that deal bleed damage or grant armor penetration. They will be very welcome bonuses to our arsenal. But if you are new or don't quite have the means to get your hands on any of these weapons, then I recommend that you just use what you can for the time being. Any melee or unarmed weapon with a bloody defect will treat you just fine, even if it is only a one star. We've all got to start somewhere after all. Next up, let's talk about the armor we should use on this build. Now ideally, you will want to run something that has a lot of damage resistance as well as some radiation resistance. Since we will be playing such a risky playstyle and also being at such low health, we will need to have a good set of armor. Ideally, you will want to aim for either a full set of Secret Service armor or the Brotherhood Recon armor. Both of these will suit our needs perfectly, as we are a melee build, we do come face to face with a lot of enemies, and an overwhelming majority of these enemies can inflict rad damage with their melee strikes. So in addition to ghoulish, it's important that we have a decent amount of rad resistance. And then on the flip side of things, if you really want to put in some hours working towards an end goal, you can grind out and attempt to achieve a full set of thorn armor. Thorn armor grants extra bleed damage per attack you deal, and also every time you are struck by a melee opponent, it also applies that bleed damage to your attackers. Thorn armor is one of the most prestigious armors a melee build can have in its arsenal, and is something I highly recommend getting and trying out. Anyways, for the legendary effects that we want on our armor, obviously we want it all to be unyielding. A full set of unyielding armor is the goal for any low health melee character, so yeah, the primary prefix should ideally be unyielding, and then the tier 2 legendary modifier should be plus 1 strength just for that extra boost to damage. If you get that on every piece of armor, then that's another plus 5 to your total strength, which does add up quickly. But then finally for the tier 3 legendary modifier, we ideally would want to aim for a full set of cavaliers. Since we are a melee build, we will be sprinting everywhere, and I do mean everywhere. <laughs> you will constantly be on the move and you rarely will stand still. So with that in mind, aiming for Cavaliers to take 15% less damage while sprinting seems like the natural choice. Additionally, it is worth noting that it's also a good strategy to have at least one piece of your armor grant you the harder to detect while sneaking bonus for when you decide to sneak on this build. Moreover, if you feel like AP regen is more important, then choosing to get the faster AP refresh tier 2 legendary modifiers instead of the plus 1 strength modifier is also a smart choice. In addition to regular armor, we have the ability to use backpacks. Now personally, I use armor plated which increases my damage resistance by 90. It's very good, it makes me a little bit more tanky, increases my survivability by just that little extra bit. And if I ever am over encumbered, I switch it out for the high capacity backpack mod which increases my carry weight by 120. Additionally, I think we should quickly take a look at what Under Armour we should use for this build. For the purposes of this build, there is nothing that beats Secret Service Under Armour with Shielded Lining. You get plus 4 to Strength, plus 4 to Endurance, and plus 2 to Perception, as well as a decent amount of Protection. Now that that's all out of the way, let's talk about modifications for our actual armour. For a melee build, it's very simple. On the legs, you want to go with Ultra Light, purely for the extra AP that you'll gain from it. Then for the arms, you'll want to ensure that only one arm has the weighted modification for the slight boost to armor penetration, and then make sure that the other arm has the brawler's modification for the extra unarmed damage. These two in combination work out to give the biggest boost to damage if you are an unarmed build. Then obviously, if you are using one-handed or two-handed weapons instead of unarmed, then just chuck the weighted modification on both arms so you'll be dealing a lot more armor penetration. Then finally, we have the chest. Personally, I run a jetpack so that I can gain a lot of tactical advantages as well as the ability to glide through the air. 
This is perfect for me because my armor's legendary effects make it so that I take zero fall damage no matter how far I'm falling from, which I absolutely love. But if you have no interest in using a jetpack, the best options would be to either pick from the pneumatic, dense, or asbestos lining. Pneumatic reduces the magnitude of incoming staggers, dense reduces the explosive damage you take by 50%, and asbestos lining negates most fire attacks as well as increases energy resistance. So yeah, take your pick. Now if you are a new player or are struggling to get that perfect set of god roll armor like I have, then I highly recommend that you just use what you can in the meantime and don't stress too much about it. It may take a while to grind out or trade for that god roll set of armor, but like I said, just use what you can, be that combat armor or metal armor, even if it is only a 1 star unyielding piece, it will be a start and that's what's important. Now let's talk about buffs. These are the items in game that you can consume or activate that will give you a temporary boost or buff to your character. The following list is every single item that you should prioritize to give yourself the biggest boost in damage possible. And as of right now during the making of this video, all of these buffs stack together with each other. You should take the unarmed bobblehead for 25% extra unarmed damage for 1 hour, then the unarmed damage magazine called US Covert Ops number 8. This grants another 25% extra unarmed damage for 30 minutes. And then we have a huge food list. I'll have it all on screen with what buffs they give, so if I were you, I would take a screenshot for later use. We have the Glowing Meat Steak, Mole Rat Chunks, Deathclaw Wellington, Mutant Hound Chops, Sheep Scorch Mutton Meat Pie, Sheep Scorch Mutton Chops, Stingwing Filet, and then Yao Guai Roast. All of these foods give the stated buffs as you can see on screen, and as far as I know, they can all be stacked on top of each other at the same time. And then we have Whiskey, which grants a plus 2 to Strength, and then if you have the Party Boy slash Girl perk in Charisma, this can be tripled to 6. Then finally comes the Chems. Chem-wise, the most effective combination is to firstly take Excel to get the plus 2 to all special stats, then Overdrive for the 15% damage bonus, and then finally, Fury for the bonus 30% melee damage increase. As of right now, if these chems are taken in that specific order, then they can be stacked on top of each other, which leads to the greatest results. Then finally, we have Vintage Nukashon. This is to top it all off when you need a massive boost. This grants 100% extra unarmed damage, as well as a slew of other AP-related bonuses. Now obviously, all of these buffs individually are great, but when you take them all at once, then that can lead you to deal some incredibly high damage. This is how myself and Captain Noob killed Earl Williams in under half a second before the damage nerf. But even though all of this was nerfed, it's still very, very effective when you put it all in combination with each other. Now, I don't recommend that you run around popping all of this stuff all the time because in all honesty, in your day-to-day -day regular gameplay, you don't need any of these buffs. You'll find that once you have finished this build, you'll be one hitting most regular enemies and tanking damage like it's nothing. The only times where I endorse the use of these buffs is during a boss fight if you want to get it over and done with as quickly as possible. Now let's take a second to talk about daily ops and this build's performance in that mode, since this seems to be the direction the game is heading. This build's ability to perform in daily ops is fantastic for both game modes, be that encryption or uplink. Since the build can be customized to adapt to become either a stealth melee build or a tank melee build, you can perform fantastically in both game modes. The strategy for uplink is simple, get to the uplink as fast as possible and tank the damage while you're in the circle. Rinse and repeat until you get to the end boss and then unleash hell. Then for encryption, however, you're encouraged to take it slower and use the stealth to your advantage. Obviously, make the necessary perk switches and then complete the objectives without being detected, locate and assassinate the code carriers, and then repeat till you face the boss. Again, just unleash hell, except stealthily this time. So yeah, basically this build can perform very very well in both of the daily ops game modes, uplink and encryption, and I'm assuming all of the future daily ops game modes that will become added in the future, I'm betting that this build will perform pretty well in there as well. Now onto the topic of boss fights, like against Earl Williams and the Scorch Beast Queen. In all honesty, a melee build of any kind will no longer be the best option against bosses. Before the nerf, melee builds were king against the bosses and were able to take them out solo in 5 seconds flat, sometimes quicker. 
Now with the damage formula change against the boss's large amount of damage negation and damage resistance, in most cases you'll be lucky to hit over 600 damage. It's only when you take the buffs I talked about beforehand that you can truly dish out some punishment on the bosses. I recommend attempting to stay in stealth against the bosses, get up close and personal, maybe remove a portion of your radiation to improve your chances of surviving the fight, and just go crazy with the stealth vat's melee attacks. Because there is no real winning strategy here anymore, unfortunately, like I said. So you'll just have to make peace with the fact that for right now, melee builds aren't going to be the big heavy hitters against bosses anymore. That is unless Bethesda makes some much needed balance reworks and buffs to certain aspects of melee. Which, obviously, I sincerely hope they take a look at and at least consider buffing certain parts of melee. Anyways, that brings us to the topic of mobbing. Now this build's ability to mob is excellent already, but if you take into account the AoE area of effect damage we can introduce with Hack and Slash and Exploding Palm, as well as rank 1 of Gun Fu, then the ability to effectively mob goes up significantly. The Queen Killer unarmed build can easily take down any regular enemy in its path, easily with one shot, with obviously things like the Milo Queen and Sheep Squatch being the exception, they are very powerful enemies. And so closes the end of this video, I'd like to leave you with some last bits of advice and to reiterate some points. The goal of this build is to deal as much damage as humanly possible for melee and unarmed. And to do that, we need to be bloodied and we need to have a huge amount of strength, especially in this new era where melee aren't exactly as powerful as they once were. But this build does excel in objective based events and quests, it's terrific at tanking damage from most enemies in the game and is efficient at killing everything the game can throw at you, with the exceptions of the boss type enemies. Unfortunately, that is where the build falls flat. If you're going to try out this build for yourself, then I encourage you to come back to this video if you ever need a refresher on any information. As always, the timestamps and the build link are there if you need them, as well as the link to my build playlist where you can see all of my past and future build videos. Anyways, that's going to do it for me. A massive shout out to all my current Patreons. Thank you all so much for your continued support on the channel. If you'd like to have your name at the end of each video as well as some other cool bonuses, be sure to check that out in the description along with my other social medias. And be sure to subscribe and like the video if you did enjoy. I've been Tia, and I'll catch you in the next one. Welcome to Valhalla.